Hi. So. While the projector is starting, I hope it's starting. But uh, so <coughs> yeah, so I'll start by uh, by saying that the um, I, I understand that the that the concept for someone that doesn't have any uh, background, the concept that we discussed in the especially in the first uh, lesson, uh, we went over like in like. In a sense, we're going over it too fast, okay? Like, uh, I know that it, this is like a, the concept there, again, like I say, they, they involve like material that you learn in a, in a general chemistry course and in an organic chemistry course and a little bit of biochemistry. So this is, but in the end, the objective, the objective of this course, most of all, is to, is to get you familiar. Like, I don't have the aspiration that you will have, like, concrete understanding and knowledge of the concepts of what we're talking about. But what my goal is in the end, like I talked in the beginning, that, it, that you have at least a sense of familiarity with the concept that we're talking about. Okay, so this is, like, my main objective. Because once someone has a familiarity, when it, what, once you can give a name to something, then you have a much better starting point in trying to understand it. So it's okay if you feel uh, confused and this is not like normal, in-depth, uh, gradual uh, building of the material. And, uh, and again, if you have any, uh, I would be happy to, to schedule times that we can sit uh, and discuss the uh, topics that are more problematic than others. Uh, in person, so really, and, and the form again, uh, none of you have uh, posted in the form yet. Well, it's okay, it's normally like that, but again, uh, don't be don't be shy like uh, about that. There's nothing. Uh, there's nothing to be like. Uh, I don't even want to put like the name, like shame or shyness in any in any of it. This is just knowledge we're all learning, so. Uh, just use this uh, platform. Okay, so um, we'll start by, the, by going over the questions uh, that were given. I'll start by saying that these are not my favorite uh, questions. The following questions will be more, it uh, will be better. I think that each year uh, I tell myself that I will, uh, uh, that I will rephrase them and then uh, <coughs> and I forget to do it. But the next ones uh, after will be better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it might be hard, but uh, just a minute. Okay. Okay. So, the first question I changed, uh, what sort of function, in, uh, what sort of functions involve the adenine base? I wrote the adenosine base. Okay, so there's no such thing as adenosine base. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. like no, it's still it's still adenosine also in the DNA. Yeah, uh, like for example, for ATP, it's adenosine three phosphate, uh, or that an in base uh, by itself. But the thing is, what I wanted in this question is, is again to show that this molecule, in the end, the base uh, that that we learned about in prior class. I don't want to go uh, too much in depth about the, the question, but uh, there was a slide about uh, adenosine and adenine base, like in particular. So the adenine base is the structure, is like the is like the ring that is attached to the sugar uh, based on the nucleotide. So if you have a nucleotide, so I'll just draw like a general structure so that you have like a phosphate and then 
and then you have like a sugar structure here, and here you have like some kind of uh, uh, aromatic structure, it doesn't really matter, but you have a formation that looks something like this. So this is the base, okay? So, <coughs> of a nucleotide. So the adenine base, uh, I, want, I wanted to, like we showed, uh, we showed examples of actually, well, well the reason I don't know like, this, this question is that we especially showed uh, the role of it, so which of this is true, for, first of all? Yeah, so it's perfectly okay that you said B and C, because this is what we learn. But in general, if you learn more about DNA, then it also has a role in stabilizing the structure of DNA strands. So it's actually A, B, and C, but from, from as far as you know, it's B and C is the correct answer uh, here. So... The yeah, so when I say information, it's in the form of DNA. And actually also energy storage, I don't like that very much because we talked about the fact that ATP is very un uh, unstable. So it's like an energy transfer unit. And not, it's not a really like a very good energy storage. Energy storage is like uh, uh, polysaccharides, fat, and uh, <coughs> these types of, uh, of molecules are better energy storage uh, for the cell. Can you explain about the same structure? So we'll talk about it when we talk about DNA uh, specifically. And then you understand it uh, much better. And <coughs> Okay, so this is a more straightforward question. So uh, if we have a, mac a macrostructure, the objective here is to fit the correct building block uh, to the macrostructure that, uh, that is formed. So the cell membrane, what is it made of? Phospholipids, okay. So polypeptides, amino acids, DNA, and again I changed this a little bit because it was written DNA and RNA. And actually, DNA RNA, in RNA, you can also attribute to single nucleotides or also DNA and RNA. But what I meant here is DNA strand or RNA strand. Okay? So this is nucleic acid, and this is also nucleic acid, and polysaccharide is monosaccharide. Okay? So, yeah. Um, monosaccharide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not a building block per se, but it's part of it. So I would not put it like here, but let's say that if it was a test, I would not put this, this question because of this misleading uh, like remark, okay? So uh, in the test, the questions are much, well, much better like closed than these, especially. And also the question that will be followed uh, later. So <coughs> what type of chemical interaction exists between sodium and water, another not very good question. Why? Because uh, the fir I put here interaction. What is interaction? Like I told you, this is something very general. Interaction, also a bond is a type of interaction. Um, but specifically here, the, the, the phrase interaction was, was here to say that it's not like a bond. Um, or like what, what type of chemical interaction we learned about the existence between sodium and water. So. I'll just skip the part and we'll explain it. So what I wanted, what I hope from this question is that you understand that it's not hydrogen bond, okay? Because there's no type of hydrogen interaction that can uh, occur between the sodium uh, and the uh, water molecules, for example. It's not a hydrophobic uh, <coughs> because the sodium is uh, charged, so it can be like a hydrophobic interaction because the fact that it's a uh, uh, that, it has a, that it has a charge means that it can adhere water or it can attract water molecules in a specific orientation. Um, and Van der Waals bond, uh, it's not a type of Van der Waals bond, although I, I, I'm sure that there is a type of Van der Waals interaction involved here, and it's uh, strictly not a covalent bond uh, in that sense. So it can have really a ionic interaction, what we, uh, what we describe the fact that, and by ionic interaction I mean that we have this hydration or hydration core around the sodium or around any ion that is in the water. And you can say that it's a hydrophilic interaction because it's not hydrophobic, so it's some kind of hydrophilic. Yeah. But if you um, compare it to other ionic interactions, it's more like a dipole. Yeah, that's what 
you mean like uh, other energy interactions like between sodium, like ion bonds? Yeah, it's nothing like it's. it's <laughs> yeah, that's why it's not. That's why it's not well phrased again. But the but the idea behind this question again is that um, is that you that you will know that when when we in the presentation. Specifically, if you look in the presentation, then it, uh, it's marked there under ionic interaction. You see the hydration of the, of the sodium ion around the... So, it's not, not true that it's a type of ionic interaction, that the sodium... So, it's right that it's like an ion-dipole interaction, but we didn't learn specifically about this type of interaction. Yeah. Uh, this was the um, yeah. Like, in, in the end, also... Uh, Van der Waals is a very general type of interaction. I think that in, in almost any, uh, in any interaction between, uh, between two molecules, you have some type of Van der Waals either repulsion or interaction or something that is happening there between the electron clouds of the molecules. Um, but it's much weaker in this sense. Like it doesn't define, uh, like a better, a better way to phrase it is like maybe what happens to an ion when it is in, in an aqueous solution. Okay, so it is covered by, by water molecules that are facing <coughs> in a specific way and surrounding that ion. So this is the objective of this, of this question. And again, don't, uh, this is not, like the first question and this question is not, are not good questions. Yeah. Uh, you could say that or they're, only, or, uh, they're also between, like, uh, Van der Waals interactions are defined between molecules, but they can also be inside the molecule. So if the molecule is bending, and you have, like, one, one side of the molecule that is folding out on the other side, so you also have Van der Waals interaction between the two sides. So it's also between atoms. It's between, like, but the one... But in covalent bonds, they share... They share electrons. electrons. Van der, Van der they don't share. They don't share. They don't share. No, in ionic bond, they, they actually they do share for uh, in a sense. Like there is no, there is no strictly there is no pure ionic uh, bond. Like you don't have. Uh, so in in ionic bonding, you do, you do have actually a degree of sharing of the electrons. Although it looks like like one of the electrons is like adopted by the other, by one of the ions, but this is actually not the case entirely. I also wrote it in the. Uh, in the file that I gave you about uh, about bonds and summary of all that, yeah. Yeah, but but in a question like that, you would assume that like you want to say you want to uh, talk about like the most uh, like the most significant and uh, obviously like the the ionic interaction or the hydration is more significant than that attraction of the dipole of the water to the and the uh, arrangement around the ion is a significant phenomenon that's happening here. But uh, again, don't dwell on this too much. Okay. Yeah. Um, so again, for that, I really recommend to read like what I uh, what the, the document I gave you about the, uh, the bonds differences and stuff like that. So over there, uh, this is like the most, uh, the most coherent and the most exact way I could find that uh, also not me like with. So then say it's a hydrogen bond? A hydrogen, we don't treat it hydrogen bond as a Van der Waals interaction. But it does fit the uh, I, I read Yeah, but we, we, we attribute Van der Waals as more of a random, like, the random fluctuation of electrons and, and it may be, but again, we are like, this is beyond the scope by miles, okay, of the, of the course. Like, we, we do not want to get into that, into these types of details, okay? So, hydrogen, uh, even if you, like, even if it's true that, and maybe it's true, like, I believe you, that the Van der Waals is a type of, uh, like hydrogen bond is a type of van der Waals, so for us, we know that this is a special bond in uh, biology, and, it, and we give it its own place, okay? 
So in, in the end, everything is uh, arising from electrostatic interaction. So everything is a type of electrostatic interaction, but really do not get into these details. This is like a, a real waste of our energy, like from what we need to spend on in the, in the course, okay? So, uh, so the important thing is to like, and to understand the differences between these bonds, they can sometimes, like, like I said, in the ionic bond, it can have a degree of covalent bonding. And like you say, like Van der Waals is a type of, like hydrogen bond is a type of Van der Waals. Okay, but, but we need to be sure that we know each one of them, what the basic definition of them mean. Okay? So we can discuss like uh, the boundaries, but they're really not important for what we, for what we need to know for this uh, specific course. Okay? So, monosaccharides differ from one another by, again, I'll just jump over it because we don't have a lot of time. So, they differ by all the above, like the number of carbons in the molecule, uh, the bond conformation around the carbons, uh, I showed that, that uh, the conformation of the bonds can change, and it also determines the difference between them. Uh, the ring size, uh, obviously, and the polysaccharides they form. So, different. Uh, Monosaccharides can form different polysaccharides and etc. Okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, besides this one, for example. But this we didn't define as monosaccharides. We didn't see an example. You write that we didn't see an example of uh, five carbon. But for example, here uh, in the pyruvat, in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this type of, uh, of sugar backbone, there are five carbon. Uh, in a nucleotide. What do you mean about like, uh, bond conformation? Bond conformation it means like when we showed the, uh, if I if I uh, if I draw this uh, like in a linear form, like this, and we saw like OH, H, and uh, OH, and H, so you can have like a molecule that looks like this, and you can have a molecule that looks like this. Okay, so like the bonds, the conformation of the bond around uh, uh, around the carbons. Questions? More? Okay. So uh, last time, let's go back to here. So we are in the tertiary structure. Uh, I showed you the different uh, ways to show uh, the tertiary structure of the protein, but in general. Uh, the definition is that this is the like the 3D orientation in space uh, of the, of the protein. So this is another level of hierarchy uh, above the secondary structure that we remember that it's composed only of alpha helixes, beta sheets, and U terms. So here we have much more complex uh, uh, structures that can form, and we divide these structures into uh, two different names. The first one or categories. The first one is protein motif, in which, uh, like I showed you these three examples, uh, in which you can have a specific uh, um, a structure or a consensus sequence that will have normally a specific type of uh, a function, okay? So if you see this type of motif, when you hear about a calcium binding motif in a protein, most of the time it will look like this. Or when you hear about zinc finger protein or zinc finger motif, it will uh, normally uh, be something that binds RNA or DNA, and it will have this confirmation of this alpha helix, and then a small beta sheet, and normally coupled with a, uh, with a zinc, uh, zinc ion that's stabilized by these size groups over here. And <coughs> uh, another, another example, in, in this case it doesn't have to be inside the same protein, but it still uh, describes a, a, a special kind of alpha helix, um, again, we, we described the molecules that part of them is uh, hydrophobic and part of them hydrophilic as amphipathic. <coughs> um, but uh, in, this, uh, in this example, the blue and the red side groups uh, of the alpha helix uh, are hydrophobic, and because of the uh, <coughs> and because of the hydrophobic uh, uh, and because of the hydrophobic effect, they tend to aggregate uh, in the center. Okay, so the next level uh, that we're going to discuss is protein domains. Okay, so 
domains are usually defined in large proteins, in which we can't uh, define them, uh, in which they form these like subdomains or sub areas of the protein uh, that we can uh, assign a specific region. And, uh, and these domains, for example, in the hemagglutin uh, protein uh, that we see here, uh, for example, sometimes it's, uh, the name is coming from is coming from function, and sometimes the name is coming from just the shape. Okay, so in this case, uh, this is the full uh, territory structure uh, of a hemagglutin subunit. Uh, we will later talk about uh, the classification of the uh, subunits when we talk about uh, the last uh, uh, level of hierarchy. So here it has uh, we can say that this protein. <coughs> has a globular domain and it has a fibrous domain. Okay. And this, uh, this strictly arises from the structure. This looks like here you have a very long half helix structures and like linear beta sheets over here. And this causes this fibrous domain. And here where you have all these uh, uh, beta sheets and turns that are intertwined with each other, it looks like more of a global or ball like domain. So this is called a globular domain. Okay. So you can define a protein. A lot of time if you look in the uh, in databases and websites, you'll find like that the protein is divided into its domains. So it's uh, like you can have a, it will say that it has like a global domain, fibrous, global fibrous domain, for example. And this is a way to subdivide the protein and to discuss like specific regions of the protein. So, like motifs for the secondary structures, domains of uh, a tertiary structure. Uh, are incorporated as molecules uh, into uh, different proteins, for example, or regions into different proteins. For example, one of the nicest examples is the EGF uh, protein, which actually starts from a longer protein that has uh, uh, many, many, many repeats of the, of the EGF, uh, and this is the EGF precursor uh, protein, which actually how um, how this, uh, how this molecule is being released is that it's actually being cleaved by specific enzymes that know how to cut uh, these bonds over here. And, <coughs> uh, and, and thus, you get a release of these EGF molecules. And these actually function as hormones. Okay? So these are, normally hormones are uh, not very large uh, proteins or, or uh, defined as peptides. So they start as, a, uh, they start as a larger protein and then are getting cleaved and by specific enzymes that cause uh, the formation uh, of multiple single EGF. So sometimes in, in uh, proteins you'll find like EGF-like domain, okay? Because this protein has, uh, has a domain in it which structure resembles EGF, okay? So uh, it's comfortable for people to, to, for example, for this protein here, it doesn't really matter what it does, but TPA has one EGF-like domain, another domain, two other domains of something else, and another domain of something else, okay? So a lot of times, these domains will signify a function, like in the sense of EGF, and EGF is the embryonic growth factor, so this is a, uh, initials for embryonic growth factor, and what it does is actually when it binds to uh, cells, it can trigger a cascade that will cause the cells to divide, okay? So, and non surprisingly, all these proteins, like this protein, this protein, also have functions as a growth, as a, uh, in, in cell differentiation and in cell growth, okay? <coughs> so the fact that we find, so let's say we want to study a new protein, so we look at the, uh, we look at the 3D structure of that protein, and we find out that it has an EGF-like domain, so most probably this will indicate towards a specific function of that protein, okay? Yeah. Um, so uh, a lot of times, a lot of times there will be like small modification if it's not entirely from the same uh, protein, but they will talk about the general structure. But sometimes it will be, uh, I'm, I'm actually not sure like if it will be exactly the same. But EJ flag just means that it's similar in the sense like, and similarity is sometimes it's really a degree. Like some people say that 80% similarity in sequence is similar, and some people say 90%. The similarity is the actual uh, structure of this, like the EGF precursor. We, when, when you see like EGF-like domain, 
it, it, uh, what they mean is like this, only one of this, like of these structures, not not the repeats that so you see here. The, the sequence of amino acids and the structure. Okay, so we'll talk in a second about like uh, homology and uh, and uh, more questions. Yeah. What we see here in the bottom line are three different uh, kinds of uh, proteins mm -hmm. combined for EGF. So three different types of proteins that have an EGF domain. Okay. So. Yeah, it has an EGF domain, and then it, and then these domains are cleaved and form EGF. That domain is formed. Yeah, the domain, the uh, the EGF domain here is cleaved, and this is actually what produces these molecules here that are called EGF. So the so the this is the actual like what happens really in the cell is that you have a gene that produces this protein, okay, and this protein is what produces these molecules. And this was a, and a, I think probably what was defined first was this component, or, and then they said, okay, this is a growth hormone or a growth factor, and we know the structure and we know how it looks. And we find this similar structure in all sorts of different proteins, and also like, obviously in the EGF precursor that produces these, so all these subunits are actually EGF. A domain doesn't have to be a binding site. So, a domain is a compartment inside a protein that we define as, ha as having some kind of other structural or functional uh, role. Okay, so it, it helps us when we're trying to <coughs> when we're trying to describe proteins. We don't have to start from the from the beginning. We can say, okay, so this protein have, has a, a three zinc finger, zinc finger motifs and one EGF domain for example, and then we can know what is the function of this protein. So, uh, and, and surprisingly, there's not <coughs> like the, so we'll talk about it in a second exactly what, what it means, but also in order to il illustrate this point, uh, I propose each year I try a different metaphor. So last year, if you saw, there was a power range of metaphor, but now there's not gonna be a power range of metaphor, so I'm, I'm sorry if you're disappointed. But <coughs> I think it missed the point a little bit, so I'm going to try this one. So let's say we have uh, we we regard motifs as components that have like specific function, and we have, for example, in this these are the subunits that compose a specific type of uh, uh, a specific type of mechanical device, and these are components that that, that make another mechanical device. Okay. And let's say that, so you can see that there is similarity in general in a lot of these components between these two, be between these two elements. So in a sense, this is like the level uh, of the motif, me meaning that we have specific components that have like specific function, and the next level of the hierarchy, we will define as like, a, this will form like the engine domain, and this will form like the air conditioning uh, domain. And why do I say like a domain? Because this is not, not like the final functional uh, entity or protein. Uh, that these, serve a, these do not serve a function like uh, strictly uh, as their own. So this is not like the example of the EGF, which does have a function of their own as a domain. Uh, but they can both of them be uh, a part uh, domain in this part of this car protein over here, or they can be separate in, for example, this uh, nice generator that has just a, an engine but doesn't have an air conditioning, or this greenhouse that does, has an air conditioning and doesn't have an engine, uh, for example. So, in a way, uh, we define these levels of hierarchy in order for us to develop a common language or a common, like, try to subdivide the areas of the protein and try to understand something about its function. And also, what it allows us is in contrast to what I showed you before, to showing a protein like this and showing the actual molecules and the molecular structure, we can just show it like this. Because in the level of the function, normally this is what matters. Okay? You want to know, like, you're not, you're not really interested about how the protein looks. You're just interested about what the protein does. 
Okay? And this describes better what a protein does than this. This actually gives you like more information if you know what each one of these domains uh, it does and how it looks like. Question? Yeah. No. So it doesn't necessarily have to have, like for example here, a fibrous domain. So they don't specify the function of that, they just attribute it because of the shape. So a lot of times, a lot of times the proteins, for example, like the global or fibrous domains here are not depicted or, at all. Like they can, there, there might as well be here, like a fibrous domain, globular domain, that are just, that their function is like maybe unknown or they don't have a function beside the part that they are like part of the structure of the protein, but they're still important to describe it, but not in terms of functionality. Okay, so this is like, for example, a membrane binding domain. So these, uh, these proteins will probably be inside a, a membrane that's going like here. Okay? So, another, <coughs> another point that I talked about, and I'll just talk about like uh, in a few more seconds, is that once we when we go along the hierarchy, we actually uh, have much more options of combinations of different parts. And thus, if you think about it, we start from the secondary structure. So the secondary structure, we only had three structures. Again, I will repeat it because it's very important. We have the alpha helix, the beta sheets, and the U-turns that we didn't discuss so much about. But it's only three structures, okay? And from these three structures, we saw that we can build uh, by combination of two or three of these, we can build what we call motifs. But, it, but then if we take these motifs, we already have, you, I didn't show you, but we have like numerous amounts of motifs, much more motifs than we have, than we have like uh, alpha helixes or, uh, or beta sheets. And then in the level of domain, we also have much more, many more domains that we can describe that are built from different combinations of motifs. And this is true also for the next level that we're gonna talk about, uh, like the final level of the of the protein, which, for example, we can we know about like hundreds of thousands of different proteins that are just composed from different combinations of domains and motifs, and in the end, they're all composed of different combinations of alpha helixes and beta and beta sheets and these random terms. So the last level, so in in the <coughs> this is the introductory side of this chapter. So, in the uh, in we we already went through the primary structure, secondary, and tertiary structure. And what's important to state in the, is that until now we've been in the same molecule level. Okay. So everything until now was coven covalently linked with one another. And again, if you don't understand what it means that it's covalently linked, then then talk to me because this is important. For example. So now we're going to talk about, uh, and again, in this level, like we showed in the, in the example of the EGF, you can also have structures that we will define as like the mature protein, and they don't even reach like the last level, which is multimeric organization. So the quaternary structure of a protein, yeah? Yeah, yeah, that's how I define it. Like a lot of people also define it like that. And uh, like I've seen, I looked into it like a couple of times because it was very important. But for, for if there is anywhere else that they define it some, like in another, in another form, then uh, it's okay. But for our purpose, we define a molecule as a, like that is covalently linked with one another, okay? So it depends which kind of bonds it has. So you can call. So for example, here in the tertiary structure, in, in the quaternary structure, so this will be defined as a as a full protein, or a heterotetramer that is divided as two two alpha subunits. In this case, it doesn't matter which one, but two alpha subunits and two beta subunits that are that are not covalently linked with one another. Okay. So also the definition. The reason that I define it like that is that this is how biology defines proteins. Okay, like biology says, like it has a specific name for 
for proteins, I don't want to say molecule, but it has a specific name for, for proteins that have more than a few subunits. So normally it will be like a, a tetramer, a pentamer, a dimer, or any other number of subunits uh, that this protein has. And it will, it will be defined as a heteropotetramer if it has like different subunits. A lot of the proteins have the same subunit that is just repeating itself. But this specific type of protein, which is hemoglobin, which is a protein that is very important um, for, binding, uh, <coughs> for binding oxygen through the hem group that we see here uh, in green that each one of these subunits has. So uh, this type of protein is always a uh, classic example of a, a protein that is only defined in the level. So we will call this entity a protein only in its uh, like a heterotetramer. So if one, someone will say like a hemoglobin protein, then it will he will mean uh, this formation, okay? Not each or if it will if the that person would wanna, would like to say like uh, would like to discuss like the alpha subunit or beta subunit, it will say the alpha or beta subunit of of, uh, of hemoglobin, okay? So they will they will be defined as subunits, and this is important especially for us in neuroscience because most of the channels and most of the receptors that we're talking about, they have different functions as a function of different subunits that they have, okay? So uh, we'll discuss that uh, in detail. Okay, so this is the, level, the fourth level of organization and this is like the, the last level that people would normally call a protein, okay? So, Above the level that we're uh, the level that we're going to discuss now, which is uh, above this level, uh, normally will not be called a protein. It will be called a protein complex or a macro, macro molecular uh, assembly. So another <coughs> another example of a, a quaternary structure is the, for example, the GABA receptor, and in this case, this will be called a heteropentamer. Okay, and it would have Two, and the nomenclature will be like this, so it will be uh, alpha 2, beta 2, and gamma. So it has two alpha subunits, two beta subunits, and one gamma subunit. Okay? And again, it's important to understand that all these are not covalently linked with one another. Okay? Yeah? <coughs> Yeah, yeah, this is, this, is our, this is actually like GABA-A receptor, like a, it's not like a general, like it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is all, all GABA receptors look like this. No, but you're right, it's always after something, better something, and yeah. something. Yeah, you're right, like uh, this is a, just a specific example of a specific GABA uh, receptor, okay? This is not all GABA receptors have the same subunits. The best receptor. <laughs> it's the best receptor. I'm not sure, I think the nicotinic receptor is better. But uh, we can discuss it later. Okay. So, uh, and what I like also about this is that it shows you like a flexibility in the end. If if uh, if the author, or the creator of this image, wants to emphasize like a specific uh, type of uh, entity or or specific type of molecular conformation uh, inside here, then uh, then we can understand from this that it has these are four alpha helixes. Okay, that are actually spanning the membrane, so if the membrane is here and here, and the end, also the carboxylic and the aminic end of the, uh, of the polypeptide chains are sticking outside in the extracellular space. Okay, so this is the extracellular space, intracellular space, and from this we learn that this is a, so I'm trying to get you acquainted to a lot of different types of forms of how people draw proteins and how people show proteins. So again, this is a, structure of the four alpha helix that are spanning the membrane. And here they don't give you any indication, like it's just simplified because the actual, the actual orientation of them is more like compact. They're not like sitting next to one another in this, in this form, okay? So from each illustration, try to see what type of information people are trying to present uh, to you. But this is not like the actual, how it actually looks. And just to show you the general structure. Question? Yeah. So, 
subunit is like the subunits can, can be comprised of several domains. Okay. So it, it really depends on the size. A lot of time, like if you have a short, if the subunits are small, and a lot of times they are, then they will not be defined, they will not be divided into domains. It will just be defined as that uh, like subunit. Yeah, yeah. The sub the subunits. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> You've been to the main. The subunits are not covenantly linked. Okay. Again, this is very important because why is it important? Because they arise from different genes, and we're going to discuss that like in the end. And what I don't want you to get when we talk about genes is that this whole complex here or this whole protein, which is defined as a uh, as a, a type of GABA receptor, is from the same gene because it's not. Each subunit is from a different gene, and we're, we're going to discuss that uh, in detail. So the domains are common? The domains are, because they're part of the tertiary structure, and not the uh, quaternary structure. So the tertiary structure, uh, like I said before, is the same molecule. And we talked about domains in the sense of tertiary structures. Okay? When we talked about, when we started talking about quaternary structures, then we're above the level of domains, okay? I'm going to steal a little bit from your break because we started late. So, uh, um, <coughs> okay, so the last level is a bit amorphic and also because of that we're not going to discuss it so much in detail, but in general it describes the, the, like the co-function or the cooperation between different proteins, okay? so. Up until now, we just saw a single protein. We just saw two examples, one of the hemoglobin and one of the GABA, channel, uh, uh, GABA receptor. But now, we're talking about uh, assemblies or molecular assemblies that are composed from uh, many proteins and sometimes also molecules that are not proteins that are acting together normally for a specific function. So <coughs> these structures tend to be very large and uh, they, they're approaching the limit in which we can start seeing them using an electron microscope. So, one of the nicest examples is the RNA, mRNA transcription initiation machinery that we're going to discuss in detail in the following classes. Um, but for now, <coughs> the only thing that you need to know is that uh, it's composed of the RNA polymerase, which is the actual enzyme that takes uh, the building blocks that we know that are nucleotides of RNA and makes a poly, um, uh, makes like an RNA strand uh, out of them on the basis of our DNA. And it acts together with specific transcription factors that recruit it to specific locations and modulate its behavior. And of this mediator complex that is, again, depicted here in very general terms, uh, that holds all these things or uh, holds all these components together. Okay? So the, the last level that we're going to discuss is just in the level of function, uh, a way for us to define like a group of proteins that are acting together. And again, that doesn't have to be solely proteins. There could also be like RNA molecules here that are acting together uh, in order to serve a specific function in the cell. And the reason that I'm saying it's amorphic because you can, you can expand it to like any function. So you can say the function of the cell is composed from like a lot of proteins that are acting together in order to maintain the cell. So <coughs> one of the nicest examples of a macromolecular assembly is the large subunit or also the small, but here I'm also only showing you an animation of the large subunit of the ribosome. Again, we're going to discuss this more in detail. This is just to uh, give you a, a, a small taste. And this machinery uh, is the machinery that is responsible for making the actual proteins, and we're going to talk about that if, you, if you're not familiar with that uh, <coughs> from before. And here in this picture, we have 31 different proteins and RNA molecules that are sitting together in this tight uh, conformation, and these are forming the machinery or the macromolecular assembly that is called the ribosome. And again, like I told you before, this is large enough for us to start seeing it in, a EM, in an EM microscope, and this is actually these small spots that you see here. Each one of them is a ribosome that is attached to an organelle that we're also going to discuss. This is called the rough VR. But uh, again, we're going to discuss it in details in the following classes. So 
So what holds them together are all types of the interactions that we talked about, like except covalent, all the other types of interactions that are uh, Van der Waals interactions, uh, ionic uh, like um, like polar interactions, um, hydrogen bonds uh, in a lot of cases, uh, and the hydrophobic effect that is pulling, like for example, the the proteins here that are more uh, or the side chains that are more hydrophobic will be in the center, in the core of the protein, the hydrophilic will be more in the, in the outer parts in general. Okay, this is a general rule, it's not, it can be like that specific types uh, can have an exception. Okay? The ribosome is not one protein, yeah. It's composed from, uh, <coughs> from many types of protein and RNA molecules that are, what? Uh, actually, I, it's not, it, it's hard, like, it's not mostly RNA, actually. Like, uh, I, also, I also said that, uh, like, a year ago, and then I checked it out, and it has, it has a lot of proteins also, okay? So, that was disappointing for me, because I'm working with RNA, and I always say, like, that RNA is the most important thing, it makes proteins, but then I found out that part of the ribosome is also protein. Okay, so we'll take a break, we'll come back in 10 minutes, and then we'll talk about a little bit of our protein evolution.
אפקטיביים בדומיינים, ושתי חלוקות, פשוט שנוצרו בגלל שהיה צורך, יש לך דברים שהם גדולים מאוד, אבל זה יש לך דברים שהם מורכבים, דברים עצומים שיש להם כאילו, כל אזור שלהם זה כאילו פונקציה אחרת. כל מיני אנזימים שמחוברים ביחד, כאילו, שכאילו, שזה צד אחד של החלבון יכול להיות אנזים כזה, צד אחד יכול להיות אנזים אחר, כל מיני דברים כאלה, והם מחוברים פשוט, והאבולוציה הם יתחו ביחד, ואז יש לך דומיין שהוא כמו... Okay, so um, we finished talking about uh, the hierarchical structure uh, of proteins. Um, and again, I will repeat it. In the first, the primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids uh, that compose like the, the linear form of the amino acids. Secondary structure is alpha headaches, beta sheets, and U turns. Uh, tertiary structure uh, is. <coughs> what we said about uh, motifs and domains. Uh, and quadratory structure, it's relevant in proteins that are formed from different subunits. Then it's the full organization of the functional protein that is composed together from different, can be composed from different subunits to form uh, the actual protein. So, um, 
We'll talk a little bit about protein evolution, not too much, but there is a relation between, like I told you, the amino acid sequence and the three-dimensional structure that the protein takes. So, and also the function of that protein. So the aspects can be used, these like the structure and function and sequence of amino acids can be used in order for us to build like an evolution proximity, proximity tree to try to trace what is the origin of specific types of proteins. So again, I'll use the hemoglobin uh, example. And here we have also uh, two beta subunits, two alpha subunits, uh, the hem uh, molecule that is a separate molecule from, this, uh, uh, from the actual uh, protein, but that its role is to bind uh, oxygen in the end. And we can build, due to similarities that we find in, uh, in different species, in different organisms, for example, these are plants. So these are monocot plants like uh, palm. And these are di dicot plants like uh, the trees that we know uh, uh, outside. And you can imagine that all these different types of uh, like organisms have the, ne have the necessity to bind oxygen. Okay? We're not the, the only ones that, uh, that bind oxygen uh, in a respiratory system. Uh, and indeed, if you, go, if you go back and trace, for example, these two subunits, uh, interestingly, have diverged in evolution uh, relatively recently. So this is like the ancestral oxygen binding protein that we assumed that there was in the beginning. And then it, it, it started to evolve. And in the end, uh, <coughs> in vertebrate, which we are the, a part of, the, of this uh, group, uh, we had a divergence. Like in the beginning, there was just the beta subunit or something that is similar to the beta subunit. And then, uh, it, di it diverged to the beta subunit and to the alpha subunit uh, in vertebrates. And for example, in, uh, in plants, you only have like, you don't have a, uh, the, the protein, the ancestral, uh, the protein that is binding oxygen in plant does not have uh, two different subunits. Okay, and this, uh, and proteins that have a common ancestor are referred to as homologs. Okay. And this is important because a lot of time there is a notational abuse and misuse of the word homologue. Like we use homologue all the time if we want to describe something that is similar to one another. So homolo homology is similarity, that's true. But it has to be in the sense of protein. When we say homologue, it says it's, that it's similar and also that it arises from the same common ancestor. Okay? So, I found a nice character that explained that uh, in terms of what is homology versus analogy. So uh, homology is similar due to inheritance. So for example, these two siblings uh, look similar to one another because they arise from the same ancestor. And these two uh, are not related, but they're similar to one another because of different factors. Okay? So, in general, in analogy, we find similarity due to what we call convert evolution. I'm not going to get into that, but if you want in the presentation, there's a link. Uh, or in Wikipedia, you can find out what convert evolution means. Uh, but we discriminate between the two terms, which is important because they also have carry information about the evolution uh, of the actual protein. So if you say a protein is homologous to another protein, normally it is meant that it's similar to one another and they have a common ancestor. So... By like being on homology, homology doesn't mean that they have to have the same, the same function. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that they have... Yeah, yeah. They can have... They can, have, they can, have uh, they can be homologous, but not strictly have the same function. Okay? There are a lot of examples of that. For example, there are like uh, uh, certain types of enzymes that lost their... Uh, uh, like uh, active site, and now they function as a, like a scaffold protein that holds complexes together. Okay, there's a classic example of the acetylcholinesterase and neuroligin, for example. Neuroligin holds the synaptic cleft together, and acetylcholinesterase uh, hydrolyzes acetylcholine, but they have completely different functions uh, in the cell, but they are like 90% similar in amino acid sequence. No, it's also, it's also sequence. But a lot of times the sequence, most of the time the sequence will also uh, implicate uh, the structure. Okay? Like a lot of times the similar sequences of amino acid will have like more or less a similar shape, at least for parts. And if you don't, you don't call uh, proteins with the same uh, function and the same ancestry, uh, or if they don't have the same... Uh, um, 
I think it would be very rare if they have like I don't, I don't I can't recall like a specific example of that that it has same ancestry same function but different sequence. So I'm not, no, but I mean like not in the sense that it's not similar like 80 percent similarity between them, for example. If they have the same same function, same ancestor, and they're completely different in the sequence of them. So uh, I don't know exactly like that specific example, but for in general terms, this is like the definition. No. No, then you say like uh, it's a recombinant or something like uh, it's, uh, there are other definitions. But, uh, but again, I'm sure that you're going to find like people that say homologous uh, like and don't uh, and don't refer to the fact that they're ancestral, that they have ancestral origin. But the correct phrasing of homology has to do something with the ancestral origin. Okay? So this is the definition, but you can find people that are using it uh, in, other, uh, in other ways. So, uh, we finished the hierarchical structure of proteins, we talked a little bit about protein evolution that's not appearing here. And now we're going to talk about uh, what happens to the protein after it's made? How does it assume the conformation or the three-dimensional space or the three-dimensional orientation uh, that we learned about before? So, in a test tube, in a sterile environment, if we throw a protein inside, like a amino acid chain that is uh, denatured, like open, and we throw it inside a, a <coughs> like a water bath or something like that, it can potentially form in, or fold into an incredible amount of different orientations and different conformations. Because you can imagine that uh, if we have like a, I don't know, this, this string over here, then I just, if I just let it, if I just let it fall, then each time that I'm going to drop it, it's going to fall like in different orientations. Okay, so it has, so potentially, proteins have the possibility uh, to fold in a lot, in, in an incredible amount of different types of conformation. It's in the order of 8 to the power of the n number of residues uh, that a protein has. But actually, in practice, because of the nature of the amino acid and the interaction with the environment and stabilizing structures like hydrogen bonds and van der Waals interactions and all the types of the interactions that we learned about, uh, uh, several, uh, like a specific or a given sequence of amino acid will always fall, like eventually, if you give it enough time, to a specific state, which is called like the native state. Okay? So for the vast majority of protein, the native state is the most stable uh, folded form of a molecule, and a lot of times this is uh, described in terms of entropy. So again, we, <coughs> we describe the system. Um, so <coughs> If we want to, uh, uh, to, to uh, decrease the amount of free energy, uh, the, the protein will, uh, uh, will begin to fold, and it can get stuck momentarily in these uh, local stable states, but eventually, and I mean like giving an uh, endless amount of time or infinite amount of time, it will eventually fold in the most stable conformation, which will be the native structure. And for most protein, I'm just saying most because I don't know about a different uh, example, but for, as far as I know, all proteins have a single uh, native structure. Okay, that is like the most energetically favorable structure that they fold, and, and, this, and this happens spontaneously. Okay, so... Um, no, yeah, it has the highest level of entropy. Yeah, the entropy is going, it, it's confusing, but this is like the highest level. The highest level? No. The lowest level of entropy. Yeah. No, but it's a low, it's actually like the lowest, uh, the lowest point of entropy because you have a... Uh, no, the, the highest part of entropy. Yeah, it's the highest. You have a low entropy, but the energy is... But the energy is minimized. Yeah. 
in the end, like when you think about it, it's it's very non it's non intuitive in the sense that you um, that then the, that you think about a, like a chain that is like uh, floating around in space and then it like conforms to something that is uh, more compact. But I think it's better to think about this not in terms of entropy, but although it's uh, also true, but to think about this is like the most stable in free energy or uh, the most stable energy state that these uh, that proteins reach. Okay. Again, I don't want to get in terms of entropy because it's a uh, Disorder. Yeah, in this case, again, I would go with the uh, with the energy. I would not. I don't want to get into the entropy terms. If you want, I can uh, look. Like I just want to devise. I don't want to say like things are not uh, they are not accurate in that sense. I think maybe I'll go like we can also maybe discuss about that uh, next class. But in general. What is, again, important here is not to, and what I wanted to say also about what we talked about before is that it's not very important for me to understand like, the full concept of what is entropy. It's, uh, it's important to, to, to understand that the protein has a specific native structure that it falls into and it's the most energetically favorable state of the system and uh, it has only a single formation. Okay. So, in vivo, what I talked about before is like if you stick a protein in a, but in vivo, protein folding, um, so again, this process, what, what are the shortcomings of this process is that it can also, it can take a, lot, a long time for the proteins to assume their uh, exact conformation, and also they can get stuck in these, uh, in these values for a significant amount of time. And the cell, the, the proteins are not also in vacuum. They have a lot of molecules that are interacting with them and can also cause them to fold uh, in a non-favorable way or not, not into their native structure. So in order to make sure that the folding, so I don't know if it, this is in order to make sure because I'm not, I don't know the master design, but there are groups of, of proteins uh, in the cell or in vivo uh, that uh, promote uh, the, sh the correct folding of proteins once they are uh, produced by the ribosome. So there are two, t two types of these chaperone proteins, and you can understand why they're called chaperones, because they're, their job is to escort, in a sense, the protein and make sure that it's properly folded. So we have molecular chaperones, uh, which bind a stabilized unfolded or partially folded protein, and preventing the aggregation, for example, like misfolding of the proteins. We're going to discuss a little bit what happens when we have misfolding of proteins. And uh, chaperonines, which is the second group, uh, which directly facilitate the environment or allow an environment that favors the correct folding of the protein. Okay, and we'll, so we'll see in a second what I mean. So. Molecular chaperones consist of molecules that are called HSPs, or heat shock proteins, and they're homologs, okay? So, molecular chaperones are these small molecules that you see here, and they function through the fact that, uh, that once the protein is uh, emerging from the ribosome, they bind to it, and through uh, hydrolysis of ATP, because this, molecule, this uh, process requires energy, through hydrolysis of ATP, they make sure that the, fo the, the protein is properly, f is properly folded, okay? So why is this, does anyone have any intuition why these are called heat shock proteins? Yeah. So most of the time the names of proteins arise from the fact that of the different experiments or conditions that they were discovered in. Okay? So for example, these proteins were discovered after they took bacteria and exposed them for heat, sorry, for high heat. And uh, I, I don't know if you know, but most proteins that we have in the body start to denaturate, meaning that start 
to grow back or grow uh, from their 3D structure into the form of a more simple structure, like into converge into the more secondary structure if you apply heat to the system. Okay? So we can imagine that a bacteria, if it was uh, if it was exposed to high heat, then a lot of its proteins are not are not denatured, or they're in a denatured state. So what a bacteria does is that it causes a massive expression of these proteins in response to this heat shock in order to fold, to correctly fold all the proteins that were affected from the heat shock. Okay? So this, this is where the name comes from. Uh, in general, it makes sense in the, in the sense that, and, but, in <coughs> uh, but in the body, in the normal system that is in homeostasis in 37 degrees or 36.7 degrees, then they still function as, uh, uh, as chaperones, they still serve the same function, but not like in the context of any heat shock. Okay, so these are molecular chaperones, and the second type is called chaperonin, which is a little bit misleading because chaperonin sounds smaller than chaperones, but that's the name, what we can do, you know. So uh, these chaperonins are actually these huge proteins uh, that actually form this barrel formation, and this barrel formation has uh, uh, reduces the degrees of freedom that the protein has to fold over. Okay, and this actually so not all proteins uh, fold in this way. Some proteins just fold in this way. Some proteins fold through the HSPs and then uh, through this mechanism. And what this does, this restricts uh, the possibility of the protein to fold and normally guides it towards the correct formation. And again, the the main idea behind I don't have the idea, but the, the main function of these proteins is also to, to fold the proteins correctly and in a rapid way. Okay? So, if you think about a protein that has like a thousand amino acids, uh, if you put it in a test tube, it, will, it might take a long time for all the proteins there to, uh, to take their native state. But in the, in the context of the chaperones, then this process happens much faster. Okay? Questions? Without chaperones, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, like stabilizing structure and energy. So, for example, if you have, uh, if I if I have this chain and I have bonds here that can form like hydrogen bonds that will hold these two together, then after a few like you can say like in, in a it, it's like tries, but like like I like to say like a lot of time this is not a static. Uh, so the molecules are moving all the time in the liquid. So it will assume all sorts of types of conformation, but in the end, uh, it will probably like find this conformation and bind in this way. But, but they don't get external assistance. In like a test tube, they're yeah. normally not in a test tube. Yeah, so. but yeah, if, if they are in the chaperone-free environment, uh -huh. then it's just the random uh, uh, folding and uh, then bonding. I, I guess nobody tested it because probably the organism would die. But uh, but yeah, then they will form spontaneously. But probably, like a lot of the proteins, will take a long time to fold into the right conformation. And chaperones are in a way like this. If I want to form this loop, so chaperones are like this marker, you know, it just promotes the correct folding and allows it to happen uh, much faster. Yeah. Each protein has their own chaperone. No, like. Uh, in general, there are not so many types of chaperones that we know about. Like, uh, from what I saw, there are only like ten, a couple of tens of different proteins that we know that are chaperones. So there, it's, it's kind of global in, the, in that yeah, sense. Yeah, Yeah, but again, w when you think about it, they have like certain amino acid sequences normally fold in the same way. So if you have like a chaperone, I'm actually not an expert in that, but I can assume that uh, that they bind like that the binding is pretty similar when you talk about the primary structure, but then uh, <coughs> uh, like like we said about the different combinations or different like in the end all of them will like form probably like a spontaneous alpha helix and then there will be a chaperone that will help them fold into the motifs and the domains. Like
But do you know how much, how many chaperones? Uh, Mark? Yeah. From what I saw, there are not so many. Like, uh, but yeah, the famous one and the less famous one. Actually, the HSPs are very famous, but they're not. But in the mammalians, they're not that common. Like, uh, in the sense. Well, it's not trivial. A lot of the proteins, uh, I guess that, again, most of the mechanism for protein folding, I, I, I assume that they're kept, like between different, uh, between different organisms. Um, but I can assume that a lot of times you, have, you can have problems in folding like proteins that are mostly expressed like, uh, like are completely different and only, only expressed in like uh, mammals or something like that. And, there you'll have problem like expressing it in a bacteria, but again I, I think that in the end the protein will form its native state, but you will probably have like all these byproducts and side effects like a, like proteins that are not folded correctly. Also, there are a lot of works now about that this is also like part of the case that I, in in the cell and this is like beyond the material, but it, but that in the cell a lot of the proteins that are forming like. I just know the example of ACHs because this is what I'm working on, but that like 80% of the protein is actually not folded correctly and it gets degraded, okay? And 80%. And just 20% of the protein, this is what I heard like from one researcher in a, in a conference that I was, and just 20% is, uh, correct, is correctly folded and is kept. So normally it's degradation. We'll talk about it in a second. Uh, that's a big question. Okay. So, uh, I'll show you a. Uh, don't uh, don't spoiler. Okay, don't spoiler for people that don't have. Uh, hello. <coughs> we didn't talk about ubiquitination yet. You're not allowed to know it. Okay. We'll talk about that. Okay, so just to show you, to, to break a little bit of the, I'll show you like a short presentation that actually summarizes. In vitro, a denatured protein can refold into its native state on its own. Nonetheless, in vivo protein folding is aided by chaperones in order to increase efficiency and prevent aggregation of misfolded proteins. Molecular chaperones, such as HSP70, assume an open form when bound to ATP. In this form, the chaperones bind nascent polypeptide chains as they're synthesized on ribosomes. The bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP. ADP exchange with a new ATP molecule causes the chaperones to switch to a closed conformation, releasing the target protein. A second class of chaperones, the chaperonins, is required to help a small proportion of proteins fold properly. A partially folded or misfolded protein is inserted into the cavity of the chaperonin, where it can fold into its native conformation. ATP binding causes the chaperonin to expand and release the protein properly folded. Okay, so again, when you think about it, this is pretty crazy, I think. I don't know what you think about it, but I think it's really crazy. Anyway, so, um, why is it this moving? I don't know. So, as I showed you, there are a lot of different uh, pathways that a protein can take in order to uh, assume its native state. So this is like, a, it's a nice way of showing that here it's first forming the secondary structure, then the, and these, 
these are the levels of the tertiary structure and so on and so forth. But we know of a lot of the diseases that are actually a result of misfolding of proteins. For example, in a lot of them are neurodegenerative diseases. For example, Alzheimer, Parkinson, mad cow, but also uh, transteritin, uh, amyloidosis. Uh, are a lot of the pathology of these diseases arises from misfolded proteins, and a lot of times there are the same proteins that are shared between different diseases. For example, in mad cow, like the tau protein is uh, involved in Alzheimer, Parkinson, and mad cow disease. Uh, we don't exactly know how yet, but we know that it's involved. Because what happens is that when you have a misfold of one of these proteins, it normally forms uh, what is the, like this short beta sheet uh, formation that tend to aggregate each other because of the van der Waals interactions. And because you can see that this structure is very repetitive and small, then it tends to aggregate with one another and form these large structures that we call amyloid plaques. Uh, in this case, okay? So uh, this is, for example, what happens if a protein gets misfolded and is not degraded by the cell or aggregated by the cell. So again, I, I don't know actually about each one of these diseases. Like I think in, prion, in mad cow we know that these prions are bad, but in all the other ones, maybe alpha synaphy is also bad, but these two for sure, we don't know if they're bad or good for Parkinson's. There was always a debate about that, if there is a cause of the effect of the disease. So, like, I, you can also think about it as a way of the body to cope and store in a very compact way misfolded proteins. Okay, that uh, they, these are also secreted outside of the cell, and sometimes and you would think that it would make sense for the cell like, to degrade it, like, or the organism to degrade these misfolded proteins extracellularly that the cell, that they won't accumulate inside the cell. In a sense, like you're throwing your garbage and giving it to someone else. So this is what happens when the proteins do not fold correctly. So this is not the end of the story, uh, the folding uh, of the proteins. Actually, most proteins, or nearly every protein cell, is chemically modified after the synthesis in the ribosome. Okay? And the most, um, some, and the modification can either be in either side of the protein, of the polypeptide chain, either in the carboxyl group or the amine group, or it can be on one of the internal amino acid residues. So, and these modifications, they determine everything, basically. They determine the lifespan, they determine the cellular location of the proteins, and they determine the activity of the protein, okay? So, for example, the most famous, or the most important a modification, uh, or maybe not the most important, but one of the most important uh, modifications that we're going to learn is acetylation, which means just that the addition of this group, that is called acyl group, to the amino acid group of the N-terminal residue. So in one side of the, <coughs> of the, of the polypeptide chain, for example here, so this is the alpha carbon, again, nomenclature. So this is the alpha carbon, the R represents the side group, of the amino acid, and this is the mean end of the, of the actual protein that is going this way. So this acetyl group, uh, acetyl group is added to the end terminal. So for example, non-acetylated proteins are rapidly degraded by uh, intracellular processes. Okay? So if, if I can point to a specific like uh, rule of thumb in cellular biology, I would say that proteins or molecules, including mRNA in that, in that sense, if they are not going through the processing pathway, if the cell has any indication that these molecules do not undergo processing after they were made, they will normally be degraded, okay? So this is like a, a general rule of thumb. It's not, obviously, it's not true for all of the cases. And you can also find sense in it uh, if you think about uh, if you think about like a, if you're like running a factory and all of a sudden you see some kind of product that is, tr that is uh, tossed to the side of the factory and doesn't have like a mark of inspection, then you'll probably like throw it in the garbage or something like that. But again, this is just my stupid interpretation. It doesn't mean that this is the mean. Okay, how much time do we have? So, 
There are many types of modifications apart from methylation, and all of them are very important. For example, uh, glycosylation, which uh, links saccharides to proteins. Um, you can have specific uh, modifications of specific amino acids, and then the amino acid actually changes its name because you know that the, the differences between amino acids is just the the groups that they are attached to them, or the conformation, or the or the shape of the carbon uh, of the carbon chain that they have in their side group. So, for example, if I take a lysine, which is a type of amino acid, and this is only the side group. No, actually, it's not. It's also the amino acid. So, if this amino acid is a lysine, and I attach to it, uh, and, and I acetylate this, so it will be called acetylazine, okay. because. In all purposes, like the body doesn't see this red marking here, because this is like a new molecule. And for example, phosphorylation is also one, one type of a very a common uh, modification uh, that is normally uh, due to the transfer of, from the ATP, of the phosphate group from the ATP. So if we have like a serine in this example, then it will be phosphoserine. In the same way, we'll have a hydroxyl, which is this group, a hydroxyl proline or a uh, methan uh, or methyl group that is attached here would be a uh, methylistidine and carboxyl glutamate uh, in the example here, okay? So, hydroxylide, yeah. Hydrolysis is breaking something apart through water, normally. Like that, that, uh, that that's why it's hydro, like, uh, yeah. But uh, like, it normally involves like a water molecule in there in the process. Yeah, but it, it has a meaning, you know, like, does this have a meaning besides yeah. the fact of uh, some group is being added to a different group? What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, but like, is it always the same? Ah, the same no, it's not. I, I guess that I guess that in some cases yeah, in some cases no, but I don't I don't know actually, but I would assume that uh, they, that some modifications are have like a constant function and some modifications can have different functions in different contexts and different amino acids that they're attached to. Because like, I hear a lot in uh, seminars uh, like methylation. No, but methylation they they mean DNA. They mean what? They mean DNA. When you say like they they mean they mean modification of DNA and they mean like epigenetics in that sense, but this is a different thing. We're talking about proteins now. We're not talking about, but in essence, it's the same thing. It's adding of a, of a methyl just to DNA. Uh, yeah, methylation methylation is adding a methyl group. Okay, but but again, it doesn't have to be the cysteine. It can uh, also a uh, methylation can happen to other amino acids. So the question arises, and I know this is bugging you from here, is that, so how many amino acids do we really have? Okay, in a sense, okay, so we started with the 20, I just like mentioned in a second, but maybe remember that there are like 20 amino acids that we know of in general, but actually if every amino acid or most of the amino acids can undergo modification, so we actually have many more like amino acids or amino acid types. So you can imagine that this increases the complexity of the possibilities of, of different proteins or different amino acids to, or side chains to have in a protein. Okay? And you can... Uh, so everything is much more complex than it seems. This is the, <laughs> the bottom line of that. So uh, <coughs> another uh, type of modification, I'm just mentioning it very, very uh, fast, is that Peptide segments of some proteins can be removed after synthesis. Either they can be removed in sort of a functional uh, purpose, like we saw in the EGF example, or they can just be removed and degraded. So like in a, in a workshop that you remove pieces of uh, wood from furniture that you don't want, so it, after like, uh, the, the initial assembly, uh, you can have removal of specific types of the proteins with specific enzymes. So there are many types of modifications, but in general we know that there are chemical modifications that alter the chemical groups that are attached to the amino acids or to the protein, 
but also they can be like a more uh, a more like robust or a more drastic I, can, I don't know if it's drastic but a different type of processing which can reside of just removing of specific types of proteins uh, from the from the mature protein after synthesis and a lot of times this process activates enzymes like we like these two, we saw in the in the example of the EGF that has function in blood circulation, digestion, or programmed cell death. But this is just general knowledge. Okay, so like we saw, uh, you can imagine that the amount of protein that we have in the cell, like the, the given amount of protein that we have in the cell, arises directly from the balance between its rate of synthesis and the rate of degradation. Okay? So it makes sense that um, like some proteins have a lifespan uh, that is short, as for a few minutes, for example, like cell division cycle, uh, that, that happens very rapidly. And uh, these proteins can just be expressed for a, few sec for a few minutes and then be rapidly degraded actively by the cell. But you can also, we, we know about examples of uh, certain types of protein, like auxins, uh, that we have in our eye, or the lens of the eye, in which, uh, <coughs> I think the lens is not, it's not the lens. Anyway, so proteins we, that we have in the eye, which can survive the, the lifespan of the organism itself. So for example, we know that in our visual system, there are some auxins that survive like 70 years the same protein. So that is, uh, so you, you can imagine that there is a huge variability uh, between the degradation and the synthesis uh, rates of different types of proteins, and this determines the concentration of them in the cell. So generally speaking, and we're not going to talk about that so much, so degradation of extracellular proteins takes place inside what we call lysosomes, which are special, special types of membrane-bound organelles uh, that have acidic anterior, but we're not going to talk about them too much. But in the cytosol, or in intracellularly, uh, this is achieved by repeated addition of uh, a molecule called ubiquitin, which is a 78 residue polypeptide that marks all proteins for degradation in general. Okay? So now you're allowed to know what ubiquitin is. So, first of all, this process uh, this whole process of ubiquitin and the protein and all this function was discovered by Aaron Chekhanov and Avram Herschel and Irvin Rose. He got a Nobel Prize in 2004 in chemistry for that. And this pathway is very well, relatively very well defined relative to other pathways that we know a little about in biochemistry. Um, in general, what you need to know, I don't want to get too much into the details of the, of the first two elements, but What's important from the, you can understand from the name, so the, we have here three types of enzymes that mark E1, E2, and E3. Again, we'll talk about an enzyme in a second, but enzymes are just proteins that we know of a specific catalytic function that we have, that they have. But, so the first one is the ubiquitin uh, activating enzyme, the second one, ubiquitin conjugating enzyme, and the third one, which actually binds the ubiquitin that has been activated and prepare it for the binding with the actual protein that needs to be degraded. Okay? So normally this happens through a specific side group, uh, this, uh, uh, this type of like a, a mid group uh, that you have here, and uh, <coughs> uh, that this binding occurs, but once the protein is, uh, is tagged for binding with the first ubiquitin, this process usually repeats itself a several, several amount of times, in order to form this ubiquitin chain, okay? And this ubiquitin chain is like a signal for the cell that this protein is, is needed to be degraded and, this, uh, and then it is recruited to a special machinery that is called a proteasome, okay? And this proteasome uh, degrades, the, uh, degrades protein into peptides and single amino acids, but normally for peptides, and to free ubiquitin mole molecules. Yeah, but definitely they're reduced, but I think that from peptides, they, they're, uh, they're like degraded in compartments in organisms or cells that don't have to, uh, to break them apart, but actually, I'm not sure how this like, happens from polypeptides to single amino acids. I'm sure that there's probably a different mechanism that does that. Uh, 
Yeah. How do the cells know when this direction should start? So this is a very important question because uh, there are a lot of different types of uh, of hypotheses around this because uh, some of them some of them we don't know some of them we do know. For example, there are specific sequences that that tend to like stick out. Normally, there are like hydrophob uh, there are hydrophobic sequences that, if they are sticking out from outside the protein, then there are specific enzymes, especially the E3, which is in charge here of the recognition, that knows how to recognize these sequences, and that this that, that probably aro arose from the fact that this protein did not fold correctly. Okay, like for so if you have like a like a strand that is like hydrophobic and you'd expect that it will be in the core of the protein, if it's on the outer side, then this enzyme can identify this, uh, uh, this sequence and then start tagging this protein with ubiquity. So this is one mechanism. But there are a lot of that I'm sure that I've not discovered yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so mostly they're lysosomic uh, process, and we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about that, about degradation in alternative pathways, but in general, if we're talking about normal cytosolic proteins, this is a, this is a general rule. Okay, so I'm just going to show you, uh, so next time we're going to talk about, in one hour, we're going to talk about enzymes, molecular motors, common mechanisms of regulation of protein function, then purifying, detecting, and characterizing. Maybe one hour, maybe two, we'll see. So, just gonna show you a video that summarizes the part of, about ubiquitin. So the little pink protein is ubiquitin. Just a minute. So the little pink protein is ubiquitin, and our yellow protein here is ataxin-1. For so ubiquitin to be carried to proteins, it needs a carrier. It's called the ubiquitin carrier enzyme. Once our ataxin has done its function and it's ready to be degraded, another enzyme will come called the ligase, the ubiquitin ligase. It comes and attached to it, and the ligase will interact with the carrier and take the ubiquitin from the carrier back to our protein. And now it can put more and more ubiquitin molecules. The protein will have to have multiple ubiquitin molecules to be degraded. And now, once it's flagged, the proteasome recognizes it's ready for degradation. The proteasome has a cap. The cap opens. The protein unwinds and enters the business end of this proteasome, the catalytic core that chops this protein into little pieces. And this protein will be degraded and the peptides and amino acids recycled. So this is really what happens for many, many, many cellular proteins. This is a very important process. And these are the players. Now imagine mutant attacks in one. It has a different shape and so it's getting ubiquitinated. So I just took this because this was the best example that I found. This is actually like part of a lecture of someone about her research. So I'm only interested in the basic process. But in general, so what you saw in this uh, what you saw in this video is uh, <coughs> like the ubiquitin lig ligase and the conjugating <coughs> enzyme that holds the ubiquitin together, like the E2 that holds the ubiquitin together and the uh, E3 that makes sure to transfer the ubiquitin from the ubiquitin conjugating enzyme to the ubiquitin ligase. But before that, you have an uh, uh, activating enzyme that knows how to take the free ubiquitin molecules and together with ATP, convert them to a more like, uh, you could say like active form that is ready to be used again. Okay, so you have another set of questions I know that normally it's uh, like in the beginning of every chapter, but this time I divided it into two. So uh, you'll, you'll see in the website that you have like uh, about, this, uh, about this chapter because it's a very large chapter. So you have like questions part one. Hopefully I looked over the questions and I made sure that they look okay, not like the last question. Uh, but if you have any questions, and also, it, it's, it's totally okay to talk about the questions before we talk about them in class, in the forum. So, I, I will like happily, you know, answer questions regarding the questions 
before that in the forum so everybody could see. So it's not it's a more it's not a test as you could see. It's a more of a learning process. Okay? See you next week. <laughs>